Good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Martin, and Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to another installment of our summer series, Women on Wednesdays. To those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute at AU School of Public Affairs and that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. We offer academic and practical campaign training for young women, and we facilitate research and discussions like this on the importance of women being represented in politics on both sides of the aisle. And we are happy that you have joined us and to talk about Republican women House candidates in 2020 with 152 days left until Election Day. And we have the perfect two people to talk to uh, about this tonight. Uh, we are delighted to have with us Congresswoman Susan Brooks of Indiana. She is currently the recruitment chair for the National Republican Congressional Committee, otherwise referred to as the NRCC. Uh, she has served four terms in the House, including two years as the chair of the House, House Ethics Committee. No small job there. And just about a year ago, she surprised everybody by announcing that she would not seek re-election for the House this year, and we'll talk to her more about that decision later. Uh, and we also have her major partner in Republican recruitment efforts, Parker Poling. She has been the executive director of the NRCC since January of 2019. Previously, she was the chief of staff to Congressman Patrick McHenry for over a decade, including several years when he was in leadership as the chief deputy whip. And I think we have some students with us tonight from the college Republicans. So I will mention that earlier in her career, she was the executive director of the College Republican National Committee. So um, they are both focused on the recruitment of male and female candidates, but they have sure been a part of making sure that the party is recruiting and supporting female candidates as well. And so they're here tonight to talk about their efforts and give us a debrief of sorts on what the landscape looks like now, about five months out from the general election. For those of you not familiar with Crowdcast, I want to let you know that um, we are going to save plenty of time for your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button that says ask a question. So please click on that and type in a question. You'll also, at that link, be able to upvote other people's questions. So if you see someone else's question that you're interested in, upvote that. So we'll see um, the questions that most people are interested in. And if you want to rewatch any part of tonight's event, there will be a replay button that will generate right after the program at the same exact link that you used to log in. And you can share that, uh, rewatch any part of the event that way. So let's get started. We'll talk for a few minutes. And then I do want to run through some candidates um, and have uh, the Congresswoman and Parker talk to a little bit about the Republican women candidates that are out there. And then, like I said, we'll save plenty of time for your questions. So the state of play, um, I want to set the table a little bit and ask you all um, what it looks like now with 152 days to go. Um, how are you feeling about your efforts um, and uh, and what do you see developing? Um, Congresswoman, we we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Betsy. And yeah. it's wonderful to be a part of um, this visit tonight uh, talking with women from around the country and really excited that so many women wanted to hear about what Republican women were doing to take more seats in the House of Representatives. Um, we have uh, we need to pick up 17 seats in order to take back the majority. Um, I came into the House in the majority and uh, I must say it is a lot more fun being in the House in the majority than being in the minority. Um, but I have to tell you, this last election uh, was pretty devastating for the Republican women in particular. We lost a number of um, our sisters. We lost a number of uh, races and lost the majority. And I think, um, and not that we didn't have an effort, Elise Stefanik had been very uh, engaged in recruitment, but um, we decided to put an ex exceptionally strong focus on recruiting women. Elise stepped away just to focus on recruiting women. And so, and with Parker at the head of the NRCC, Tom Emmert, at, who is our chair, asked me to be in charge of recruiting. 
And I'm just going to start out by saying I couldn't be prouder that as we sit here right now, we have 226 Republican women running for Congress across the country. The last time we had uh, this minute, the highest number we've ever had is 130. And that was in 2010 when we flipped the house. Yeah, I want to I show a little graphic of that, and you can see yeah. that we made diverse. They have incredible backgrounds. They're very excited to be running as Republican women across the country. And I think I've rambled on enough. I'll let Parker speak a little bit as well, because she has been leading an amazing team of people. Our field directors go out and work with us with these candidates. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I'm so grateful um, for Congressman Brooks' service as our recruitment chair and sticking with us even as she decided that you know her life was going to take a different course. Um, but that actually freed up a lot of time for her to talk to candidates, so it's been great. Um, we're you know we feel really good about where we are in the landscape. Um, just at the thirty thousand foot view. We need 17 seats to take back the majority, and we're certainly on offense. We have 30 Democrats in seats that President Trump won, um, and an additional 23 districts that were recently held by Republicans. So we have a really big playing field. I also think the recent special election win of Mike Garcia in California 25 has really energized our members, our candidates, our donors, our voters. Um, Mr. Garcia won in a district that had been um, won by Hillary Clinton by seven points and by the, the prior member by nine points. So for us to flip that district, I think really demonstrated that we can win in the suburbs um, and that we know how to, how to compete in these tough races and that 2020 is not 2018. So we're excited about, um, we feel very good about the environment and we're extremely excited about the caliber, the quality and the quantity of candidates that we have this week. Let me ask you, um, Parker, because the Congresswoman alluded to this, kind of what happened, um, especially among women um, after the 2018 midterms. And this is just a chart that shows you the, the number of women in the House. And you can see back in 1987, it was essentially equal between Democrats and Republicans. Um, Democrats had 12 female members of the House and Republicans had 11. And then as we've gone on here, you've seen Republican, number of Republican women stay essentially about the same, a couple of upticks here and there, but then actually decreased down uh, to only 13 uh, after the 2018 midterms, while the Democrats had um, 89. Um, what did you all, as you sort of looked at what happened in the midterms, what did you all attribute that large disparity to, um, I'm sure there were a couple factors, but as you kind of look back, what did you decide that you needed to do differently this time around? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we had to get more women just to, to run just to begin with, because you obviously can't win if you don't run. And that was why this was a huge focus. Um, you know, I think a lot of our candidates and, and Congresswoman Brooks should speak to this, were actually inspired by the record number of Democrat women who were elected um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the sight of them and swearing in day on the House floor was really, really powerful. A lot of Republican women looked at that and said, I support women in office. I think that's admirable. But those women don't represent my political beliefs. And so I would like to be inspired by them to run. But, but present a different um, point of view. And um, I think that was a huge factor. And I, you know, Susan could speak more to that for sure. I do have to say, while it was really, it was great to be part of the Congress where we have the highest number of women ever in our country's history. And I'm proud to be a part of that. And I also gave kudos to the Democrats for bringing in that many women. Um, and our conference, uh, I think, was um, changed its focus after that. I think we lost some seats that we weren't expecting to lose. And, um, and we also saw with, uh, through Act Blue, quite fr frankly, on the Democrat side, and the focus on pushing that many women through the, the Republicans, I think, 
and our leadership, everyone said, we have got to compete with more women candidates. We've got to help them get through primaries. And we are now seeing, I would say, more of our leadership and more of our rank and file members getting behind Republican women in primaries because often our women have had a difficult time with fundraising and making it through primaries. And now we have, the women have always, Republican women have always worked really hard to bring more Republican women in. This time we really pushed all of the membership uh, to be really helping Republican women, to find a Republican woman in their district to either recruit them, or if they, you know, if someone was running in a primary in their state, we ask state delegations to get much more engaged and to help us find more women run and then to help support them. And I think we're seeing that benefit now come to fruition. There are just a lot more women who are feeling supported, not just by the women Republicans, but by the men and women. Congresswoman, could you also talk about some of the outside groups and um, what they've been able to do? There's several of them now, UPAC, um, at least Stefanik's group, EPAC, um, Women for Women, um, that seem to be more out there this time than I've seen before. Can you talk about their impact? Absolutely. Um, VUPAC has been around for quite some time. Um, I have to tell you, VUPAC, uh, led by Julie Conway, was the only PAC that supported me when I ran in 2012. I was in a crowded seven-way primary. Um, and uh, actually, we just had a primary yesterday in Indiana where 15 people ran for my seat. And I have to tell you, so even more crowded than mine, I'm very proud that a very strong conservative woman named Victoria Sparts um, dominated with about 39% of the vote. So she is going hopefully to be taking my place in the fifth. I'm gonna be working with her. Um, but UPAC was the only one that came in back then. And um, you know, Elise did shift her focus to create her EPAC um, and to focus exclusively on recruiting women. Winning for Women has gotten very engaged, a group called Right Now uh, mm -hmm. Women as well. Um, you know, we have often, Maggie's, there's Susan B. Anthony, there have been other groups that have always been out there, but I think they are getting more engaged. We, we have a lot of groups that focus on it, whereas the Democrats, it's primarily Emily's list. Um, and our uh, groups, I think, are probably uh, more diverse in some ways in the women that they support. Um, but I always tell everybody, and it's awesome to have, those groups support, but at the end of the day, it's not the groups in DC that win the race for you. It's your hard work and your connections and network at home. Parker, I wanted to ask you and, and see if we can maybe go through a couple of women out there just to give folks a sense of some of the races and um, a little bit of an overview of some of the candidates. Um, I want to start with um, Mary Miller. Um, who is pretty much your sure thing candidate. She is um, running, a, a, won the primary in a, a safe, a quote unquote, safe Republican district. Um, she won her primary in March. Can you tell us, can you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, um, uh, Miller is a, a farmer and um, her husband's a state rep in, in Illinois. And she um, threw her hat in the ring when um, Mr. Shimkus decided to retire, she really just almost sailed through. Um, it was, you know, she had a primary, but um, she really just dominated the field. She had the support of outside groups like Club for Growth and the House Freedom Caucus. And um, that, those have proven to be groups that are really effective in a Republican primary in a district like this. This is, you know, a district that um, the president won by 30 plus points. So, um, you know, this is this is a very safe seat. So she is sort of a de facto member of Congress at this point. Um, we still do have a few other women who are running in very, very safe Republican seats. Um, Renee Swan is in a runoff in Texas 17. There's a couple women in Tennessee one. So we're hopeful to add to our numbers of um, sort of guaranteed uh, Republican members. And then Congresswoman, um, 
um, had their primary um, yesterday, and the Harlots won that. Can you give us a sense of um, of her? It's not a safe seat, but it certainly is a, a likely uh, Republican seat. Well, Victoria is truly the American dream story. She is. Um, she was born in Ukraine, um, uh, married a Hoosier, came over to this country, uh, so went through the whole immigration process, um, and she married. He is a, a very successful grain farmer, so they have large farm property up in the northern part of the county we live in, which is the heart of the district. Um, she's the mother of two, but she's a CPA. She's been an auditor of major Fortune 500 companies. She's been an activist in the Republican Party. And um, she is one of the hardest workers, incredibly smart. And I think people just loved her story because she talked about fighting socialism. She talked about living under socialism. She talked about the importance of capitalism, the importance of entrepreneurs, the importance of working hard, um, the importance of you know less government. And that message resonated with the voters in the fifth. She's also a state senator, I might add. She actually um, won in a caucus. So she was uh, finished. She's just finished her first uh, state Senate. Um, and she was contemplating running for reelection and then decided during this General Assembly only a couple of months ago to jump in this race. Now, I will tell you, she's self-funded. And uh, now she's going to have to pivot and really put together a significant fundraising effort that she, it was during COVID that she decided to run and she did not want to ask people for, for money. And so mm -hmm. she is going to have to shift in order to get more financial support. But, uh, but she really ran a very strong, very good campaign. And club came in for her um, and actually hit her top opponents um, who were probably, you know, the, the closest to her in the running, but she had tremendous name ID pretty quickly and uh, had really powerful television ads, did a lot of really smart things. I'm very proud of her. And there are some competitive, more competitive seats. Um, there's one competitive seat um, that is um, Republican held and um, Beth Ben, is it Doyne? Is that how you pronounce the part of um, and dying, yes. She won her primary March third. Um, and she's in a competitive district here, um, but it is a Republican seat um, because it's open seat. Can you tell us about her a little bit? Yeah, Beth actually has a great story. She's a single mom, and she first ran for the city council um, in her hometown of Irving, Texas, because the uh, playground that her her son played at was um, insufficient. They needed a new playground. And so she really got in at the grassroots level. Um, as you can see, she then went on and ran for mayor and was um, twice the mayor of Irving, Texas, which is um, the biggest city like, partially in the district. Um, and she then went on and worked in the Trump administration as a regional HUD administrator. And when Mr. Marchant decided not to run again, she, she stepped in. She had a primary, and in Texas, you know, there's a, um, if you don't get at least 50% of the vote in the primary, you have to go to a runoff. And she was able to clear that hurdle, which is really, really impressive, is not easily done. And so she's really good about that chances. I think she will be a member of Congress. Um, she has the right combination of the local groups, the great story. She understands um, her constituents there. and. Um, we're, we're very excited about her. And now there's several uh, competitive Democratic seats where you have candidates running, and a few have won their primaries already. Um, Ashley Henson just won um, in Iowa yesterday. Yeah, Ashley is absolutely one of our best candidates, and you can ask anybody who works at the NRCC or follows this, and they will all talk about Ashley. Um, she's a current state representative, but she also spent 13 years as a news anchor on the Cedar Rapids local news. So she has obviously name ID. She has a presence. She's very um, telegenic and very um, well spoken. And uh, but her husband is in the local insurance business. She's a mom of of two sons, and she's just um, she's been a 
extremely strong fundraiser, very, very hard worker. Um, she had a nominal primary and easily won yesterday. She has the support of the entire Iowa political establishment. And um, this is a district that uh, President Trump won. And we think that Ashley is just a perfect fit for this seat. I should say she has over a million dollars cash on hand. She has worked her tail off raising money. And I don't think people think about states like Iowa or Indiana as, you know, A, needing that kind of money to win, but we do. Um, we absolutely need that kind of money to win because it's all about getting your message out, making sure that you can, especially during this times of COVID, you have to be on television. People are watching television like they've never watched television before, not since I was young, little. Um, and so you've got to be on television. You've got to have strong digital. People are actually reading their mail pieces because it's, out, it's contact from the outside world. So you got to have the money to make these messages, you know, to really penetrate with your message. Ashley has really set the bar high for our other candidates, male and female. We're very proud of her. I agree with everything Susan just said. <laughs> I think we lost you. Betsy. I think we lost Betsy. I'm not sure if we lost the audience. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I was trying to yep. fix my microphone because I'm okay. sorry I see feedback, but hopefully that may have resolved some of the issues. So or maybe not. Um, okay, let me, uh, <laughs> let me go back um, to, um, let me pull this up here, to um, Iowa yesterday, Marionette Miller Meeks, um, who also won. Did I cut, I cut out, did you guys talk about her? No. Not yet. Okay. One of you take it away. Oh, oh Parker's on mute now. I just there muted you. myself to limit the background noise. I feel like you should start with uh, Dr. Meeks. Oh, okay. So Dr. Meeks has run before, and but it's so interesting because when she came back to talk to us again, she said, um, I learned so much. I learned so, you know, that I need to do things differently. She's been incredibly um, enthusiastic in her run. Um, she uh, is, a, is a physician. Uh, she is a great listener. Um, I think she's going to have a real shot at uh, this seat. So, and it's an open seat. She has name ID. Um, she's prominent in the community. And so I, I, think, I think she's got a real shot this time. Dave Lobesack had been in Congress for a very long time. So it was hard when she ran, you know, the last time. But now with this being an open seat, I think she's got a great shot. Yeah, because she actually ran three times. I yes. Guess, um, okay. Also, yesterday in New Mexico, that Harold she was um, is going to be running in a rematch uh, in the general election, also. Right now, Parker, um, I didn't see how um, I wasn't able to see how well everyone did. But when you've run before, you learn so many things about how you would do things differently. And trust me, people tell you how you should do things differently. Um, and uh, so uh, Yvette did run last cycle. Um, it was very well liked. Um, I think needed to really focus on fundraising. And, um, and and I will say that that is something that's incredibly difficult to do. It's a very, it's, a, it's difficult to raise the kind of funds that we all need. But hopefully Yvette will be able to make it across the finish line this time. But it's she's up against a very tough incumbent, uh, someone who has worked very hard. But I think Yvette can get it done. How about you, Parker? Yeah, I mean, this was one of the closest races in the country last time. Um, Yvette lost very narrowly to Sochi Torres Small, um, less than a point. Um, I believe it was about five, I think it was 550 votes or so. It was very, very close. And that was in a high watermark of this of Democrat strength. Um, this cycle, you know, with the president, the president won this district by 10 points. This is a very strong Republican district. This was held by Steve Pierce for a long time. 
Um, Yvette actually worked for Steve Pierce for a while. So she, I, I agree. I think she learned a lot. Um, and I think with a better environment, um, I, I think she's going to win this time. And then there are a couple of, um, a couple of primaries left um, to come with some of the women who are in these competitive seats. And I just want to run through a few of those. Um, this is a former member of Congress herself um, trying to get back into the House, Karen Handel. She won in a special election. Um, and then she's in another rematch as well. Yes. Um, and Karen has always been a good fundraiser. Uh, she was a great member. She's former Georgia Secretary of State. And again, she lost very narrowly. Um, one of the interesting things with Georgia last cycle is that Governor Kemp, in his um, re-election bid, really focused on turning out voters in the in the deep red rural areas of Georgia, and did not spend a lot of time on the Atlanta suburbs, which is obviously where where Karen is located. And so she, the turnout in that area just wasn't as strong as it could have been. I think again, just as we talked about, you learn a lot. From, you learn more from a loss than you do from a win sometimes. And I think we, as a Republican Party, learned a lot from that. Um, and I think she, Karen, learned a lot as well. And um, you know, emphasizing the turnout in the suburban districts is going to be really important for the presidential race, two Senate races, and two competitive House seats in the Atlanta um, media market. It's going to be. Um, I don't think turnout will be as much of a problem. Right. Um, Karen, that was a huge loss, just so you know, the Republican women in Congress when she lost. Um, she was a terrific member, and we were devastated with her loss. Um, she took a little time to decide whether or not to jump back in, and it's uh, after you go through a loss like that, we were thrilled. I talked to her a couple of times. My colleague Jackie Walorski talked to her a couple of times, and then it's like, we need to back off. She's got to. She's got to want this um, with everything she's got once again. When you're in a race like this, and um, she did jump back in, and she has jumped in with incredible enthusiasm, has done really well fundraising. But I will tell you, even with her numbers, and I was trying to look them up, and they're very good. Mm -hmm. They're never. They're never quite enough. We always need to keep pushing and keep uh, getting our supporters and our donors and people to think about giving to Republican women. We've got to get our donors at all levels, small dollar donors, high dollar donors. I have to tell you one story about Diane Black. She always, when she would, she loved telling this story. If she, she would ask donors, which were often her big donors are, all of our big donors are typically male. Women have not often given as much candidates as our Republican male donors, but she would always ask the wives to come to the events with their husbands because she usually got a lot more money out of them than the men. The men would write her a check for a thousand. She said, if I could get the women and the men together, I could get double maxes. We've got to get our women donors on their own to be giving more money to women candidates. We've got to be getting the male donors on their own to be giving Republican women more funding. And that's something I've been saying, I'm gonna keep saying it. We've got to financially support. You can do it through groups like VUPAC and other groups, but you can also, you know, certainly um, support women at any level that you can, you know, that you can handle at this point. South Carolina, this is another a candidate with a, a great kind of story and background. The first female graduate of the Citadel. She's Incredibly sharp. Go ahead, Parker. Yeah, um, Nancy's a extremely strong candidate. She is in a crowded primary, and then she doesn't get involved in primaries. But I think any any outside observer will tell you that she's the front runner there. Um, like you mentioned, first female graduate of the Citadel, a state representative, um, a mom, and um, you know a very um, personable and compelling individual. Um, she's put together a great team. She's she's a very strong fundraiser. Even in a crowd, it can be hard to raise money in a crowded primary. She did 375 last quarter, which is really strong. Um, so we're excited about her candidacy and think she's a great fit for this um, Charleston Bay district. 
I'm going to scroll through the next couple ones um, because I want to be sure to save some time for some questions. So uh, I'll just say um, uh, New York 11, the primary is uh, June 23rd. Um, uh, Nicole Maliotakis, uh, running against the freshman uh, Congressman Max Rose, um, former for another former representative trying to get back. Claudia Tenney, um, she has a rematch against a, uh, the freshman that beat her um, last cycle, and that's a June 23rd primary. And then at the end of the month, uh, June 30th, Stephanie Bice uh, from Oklahoma, uh, one of those freshmen, uh, freshman woman, Kendra Horn. Um, she is a state senator. And then we also have uh, Michelle Fischbach, former lieutenant governor of Minnesota, um, and she's been endorsed by the Republican Party there and has the official primary on August 11th. Um, and so I just, what do you, what do you see, um, both of you, as sort of the trends that you're seeing about of the, these women that have been successful so far in these primaries? I noticed a lot of rematches, and I do think it's important to understand when women run, sometimes it takes more than one time. Right. Jackie Walorski, who's a very uh, successful member of Congress, is one of those women. People forgot that she ran um, against Joe Donnelly the first time for Congress and lost. Um, he then ran for the Senate. In any event, she won. And the next time she tried and has you know, been a tremendously successful Congresswoman. She likes to tell that story because she tells a lot of these women not to give up, not to give up. Um, but I think what we're also seeing is that, um, and many of these candidates are working very hard to reach out to members, to ask them to support them. Um, in the past, a lot of them used to be more comfortable just reaching out to the female members and asking for support. They are not there reaching out to everyone, male and female. Um, a lot of us are investing a lot. I've already written over $100,000 worth of checks to candidates. Um, and now, and we're really trying to demonstrate to our colleagues how important it is for them to support um, these women. And I, I think we're seeing it. Um, and the women are, uh, a lot of these women have had other elected positions like Lieutenant Governor. I mean, what an incredibly impressive resume, like having been a mayor, like being a state rep. So we're building a farm team at the state and local levels, and we're really trying to get some of those women with incredible experience to, you know, to step forward and be our nominee. That's what we're going to do. I want to get to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, the first one is from Austin Harrison, who asks, um, how can we Republicans, aside from candidate recruitment, expand our base to include a more diverse set of people? How can our party look more like America? Well, I'm going to start by saying, and while this was focused on women, and I talked about, uh, you know, shout with the 226 who have filed, correct me if I'm wrong, Parker, and I'm really proud of this, we have 187 people of color who have filed. Um, Stephanie Bice is Iranian-American. Maria Salazar um, from Florida, I believe, is Cuban-American. Um, we have many, so many, we have Young Kim, Michelle Steele, uh, Korean Americans, Chinese Americans. Um, we are seeing an incredibly diverse field of women and men. And we're very proud of that. We're, we've worked very hard and um, it, it's very exciting. They want to be a part of the Republican Party. They see a place for them in the Republican Party. Now we need to get them elected so that the rest of America can see that our party reflects ideals of, uh, of people of all races. Yeah, we are not just breaking the record on the number of women candidates filed. We've also broken, as far as we can tell, records on the number of minority candidates and the number of veterans who have filed. So we are really um, striving to have a conference that looks like the, the districts that we represent. So it's um, it's been really successful this cycle, and we're excited to see more folks like Mike Garcia, who just got elected in California. Um, so that's been a, a, a huge focus of Chairman Emmer and the NRCC, as well as a lot of our partners on the outside. 
And I want to give again kudos to Parker because the uh, field operation team, the field directors have worked very hard to talk with these candidates to help these candidates. Um, and it, it's been really awesome to, to see their efforts. These are very seasoned, uh, mostly young political people who fan out across the country. They're given sets of states to focus on, and then they coach and, and help uh, candidates, um, you know, try and get across the finish line. Without choosing, NRCC doesn't choose, but members choose. That's why I've chosen to support different candidates. NRCC stays neutral, but they absolutely have said, we're going to make sure that these candidates have the tools that they need. Great. Uh, here's a question from uh, Callie, uh, who asks, what is an ideal response to the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality in America look like for Republican candidates? Well, I will share with you that I was on two calls today, um, obviously with incumbent members, um, uh, talking about uh, the, the racial issues in the country, what our agenda might be. I believe it must be bipartisan for us to move legislation forward, whether it is criminal justice reform, whether it's police reforms, um, and there is absolutely a desire to do that. Um, I don't think that our candidates can shy away from it. It is over, it's overtaking the country. It's not, you know, concentrated in one geographic area. And, um, and particularly if we want to attract young people to the party, and we absolutely do, it's the future. We need to make sure that we are listening, that we are absolutely putting forth solutions. But we got to listen first. Many of us have been listening for a very long time. I'm a former deputy mayor. I've been involved in police community issues mm -hmm. for decades, um, and they need to call on our experience. And I think Leader McCarthy will be doing that. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from former Congresswoman Connie Morella, Republican Congresswoman who uh, we are super fortunate to have her uh, as one of our uh, professors in the Women in Politics Institute. And she says, Susan, we love you. Why are you leaving Congress? So, well, thank you, Connie. And I've always loved uh, any opportunity I have to be with Connie. Um, I, I accept that invitation. Um, I came into Congress knowing that I was going to term limit myself. And I actually told my constituents that. I said I knew it wouldn't be more than 12 years. Um, and I'm in my eighth year this year. I have loved my service. Um, but I just felt that it was uh, time to pass the baton. Um, I'm turning 60 years old this year. Uh, I have maybe one more chapter, not necessarily an elected office. I have loved it, but uh, I also just family dynamics with elderly parents and elderly in-laws. Uh, I haven't been able to be very engaged in their care. And it's time, everyone, my family has completely supported me throughout my career. It's, uh, it's time for me to be more focused on my family. And that's really why I'm not running. I love what I'm doing. I'm going to stay involved coaching, recruiting, and financially supporting uh, Republican women. Um, I'm not exactly sure in what role that will be, but um, I'm not going away. Good. Um, let's see. Here's a question, Parker, um, that might be good for you um, from Emily. She says, how can we help alleviate uh, elevate, excuse me, female Republican candidates other than with donations. So what else can folks do um, besides donating to help um, help candidates? I would absolutely encourage anyone who hasn't already done it to volunteer on a campaign. That was the, you know, how I started. Um, I started out in college Republican, knocking on doors, making phone calls. Um, you know, a lot of it now we can do from our homes. We have, um, an app that we can, um, you know, you download on your cell phone and it automatically dials voters. You can choose what district you want to call into. It could be your, your home district or it could be somewhere across the country. So love to have um, more folks sign up for Trump Talk is the app name, but it is, um, you know, something that we can use in seats across the country. Um, or just, you know, show up at the, at, you know, at any level. And I think, you know, probably Congressman Brooks would agree with this, that, you know, especially when you're running for the first time, you're running at any level, somebody who shows up and wants to help, you're just so extremely grateful for the assistance that 
I think you'd be welcomed with open arms. Um, and there's a whole variety of tasks. Some people don't like knocking on drunk doors. Some people don't like making phone calls. People that will write letters to the editor who will, you know, talk to their friends and family. I mean, there's, there is a role for everyone in the campaign. So anytime I talk to young people, um, you know, who are trying to get a job on the Hill or, or an internship, I always encourage people to volunteer on campaigns. It really gives you a much fuller picture of um, what it's like, how to get here, what the pressures of, um, of the campaign are on a member. It's been, um, it's really important. So I would highly encourage you to do that. Probably the only things I might add, um, and Parker's, you know, has been working with young people for so long. And uh, now the importance of having digital volunteers and digital uh, discussions, um, as well as uh, like today, our, our election ended today. Believe it or not, you need volunteers to go out and pick up yard signs. You need volunteers to help you, you know, um, really kind of close down a campaign for a little bit to get ready for the general. Um, you need people that just expand your network and that will talk about you um, on their own with their networks, getting people out to vote. There's just so much that people can do at all levels of campaigns. Um, so I hope that uh, they find a candidate they wanna help. It doesn't even have to be in the same state. We, some of these people you might be excited about, um, you can find ways to volunteer digitally for their campaign. Great. Um, we've got a couple of questions about the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have been watching Mrs. America, um, but a couple questions there on the Republican Party and their stance today on the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, certainly, I believe in equal rights for um, for everyone and for women. I think um, just like uh, Justice Ginsburg said, we have to start over. Um, it, it can't just be picked up because that's not um, how it was passed initially. We would need to start over. There needs to be, um, there needs to be modification to probably the language and how it gets passed um, because women have come such a long way in our society. And I absolutely believe in equal pay for women. I absolutely believe in equal rights for women. The women before me, like Connie Morella and others who have fought so hard, we are not saying we don't believe in equal rights. I personally just believe we're at the place just like you know, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we have to do it the right way, the lawful legal way. And she's the one who actually, as a champion in our country, has said, we, we have to start over. Parker, do you want to weigh in on that? I mean, I think um, Representative Brooks has said everything. She's the policy expert. Um, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just a campaign hack now. Okay. Um, Two campaign questions for you. Um, it campaigning in the era of, of COVID now. Um, a couple points on that. How is that impacting? That you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but how do you see that impacting um, the election? What are the ramifications now for moving or changing the convention, and how that would impact specifically the ability to promote some of these female candidates? And then also your thoughts on mail-in ballots, um, how that is an impact. As I saw something the other day where someone said it actually might be helpful to Republican to women candidates in particular because um, folks that are voting by mail have the ability now to take their ballots home, jump on Google. It's you're not necessarily relying on name recognition, um, but a lot of um, you know, male uh, permits who have been in other elected offices may have, so it might actually help there. Anyway, your thoughts on those three topics that are loosely related. Yeah, I think one thing that um, has been good is we've just went through the experience of two special elections in the age of uh, coronavirus. So we had both um, Tom Tiffany and Mike Garcia who had to learn how to campaign virtually, which means hosting tons of Zoom um, meet and greets 
One thing that I would say is a, is a slight silver lining to all of this is that members from across the country can come be special guests for our candidates because we don't have to travel. So, you know, Mike Garcia can have leader Kevin McCarthy at his Zoom event, whereas in order to get the leader to, you know, come to your event, it's a logistical challenge. So that has been a little silver lining. Uh, but they had tons of volunteers working from their homes, making phone calls. One of the big um, efforts, and this relates to mail mail um, balloting. So every registered voter in California 25 was mailed a ballot. We then will call and make sure that they actually return them. And so that is another um, volunteer-driven activity is calling through the list. Did you get your ballot? Make sure you return it. Can we help you with it? Do you need any information? Do you need anything in order to do that? Um, and it turned out that that was a really successful effort. So I know that there are um, some folks who are skeptical about mail voting, but from what we saw in California 25, and you know, an election that was, I think, upwards of 90% of the votes were cast by mail, I think we have a model that can be very successful there. So I think mail uh, voting by mail can can work um, to our advantage. Um, and there was a third point. The convention. Oh, the convention. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's very much up in the air right now. Um, and we are, you know, we are participants in the convention slash observers as opposed to organizers. So we are really just um, waiting to hear from the RNC what they think they can um, do in this, you know, unprecedented time. They, of course, are keeping safety of the delegates and the guests as a priority, um, but they also want to be able to gather and um, celebrate the nomination, the renomination of the president, and do that in a responsible way. So um, we will we will see what happens there. I don't know if you want to add anything, Representative Brooks. Well, I've talked to a lot of candidates um, about campaigning and what it's been like during COVID. Um, and it's a challenge, but it's a challenge across the aisle too. It's not just our Republican candidates' challenges, it's Democrat candidates' challenge. And so um, I think that in some ways um, they can be reaching by doing uh, teletown halls. They might be reaching more people than they might be at an event. Um, by uh, I, for instance, have participated in a fundraising event uh, for some candidates that to what Parker has said, um, I might not have had the time to get to that event. And so I was able to answer questions for donors on, on that candidate's behalf. Um, I think that Politics and elections are typically, um, you get a much better feel when you can see someone though, and when you can get a sense of their body language or get a sense of the crowd. Mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge is that while you might see a couple of people on a screen, um, it is hard to get a sense of the crowd because we really rely so much on body language and on reading a crowd and understanding what people are liking or what they're not liking, what they're understanding, what they're not understanding. That's very hard to do uh, virtually. So um, I feel for these candidates. Um, it is a struggle. There's no question about it. But I also think with kind of the country's engagement in such a significant way, I think we're gonna see really pretty significant turnout. We had, I haven't heard the numbers yet, but in Indiana, there were long lines at some of the polls, but a t ton of people took advantage of the mail-in uh, mail ballots. Great. So we may see increased engagement, mm -hmm. which would be a good thing. Um, Congressman, this is a good question for you. Um, many people, many women don't seem to understand how important Republican women in elected office are to a functioning democracy. Can you give the top three things to emphasize that in making the case? The top three points why having Republican women is important to our democracy. Yes. Um, well, I would say that um, so many of 
I, I would say it's fairly universal of the Republican women that um, we, we strongly believe in capitalism. We strongly believe in entrepreneurs. We strongly believe in um, our education system and on people that being the key to success for everyone. Um, and we also, I think, strongly believe in the power of women. And, um, and we've had incredibly strong women um, in government at all levels, not enough. Um, but we also believe that women are often the best ones to talk about healthcare decisions, talk about decisions for themselves and the families that they make. And so we think it's critically important that women have a voice in our democracy. Um, but we do have to start. It can't start with Congress. Um, we need to make sure that more women are elected to state legislatures. We need to make sure more women are elected to city and county councils, that they're mayors, that they're governors. Um, and then I think we will all do far better in bringing more women to be voices, you know, in the people's house in Washington, DC. Um, but I really do think that um, conservative women and um, decisions and things that a lot of conservative women focus on are very important uh, to the dialogue and discussion in this country. And that is why it's so important that we elect Republican women. Great. Um, I want to ask another question from Callie, um, who has asked a question about Trump and the Trump factor. Um, she says, um, how should Republican candidates address the divide between Republican voters who support the president versus those who are calling for his resignation or maybe who don't support him? And how is this going to affect um, undecided voters? Well, I think that, I mean, certainly the president has an impact on our races. Um, but yet, I think that, um, so I happen to personally have, uh, through the ratings, a very high voting percentage with the president and what are viewed as the president's policies. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I might agree with every single thing that the president says or does. And I have, and I've talked with other candidates about this, there are certainly times when I have spoken out against the president, but I also am not going to speak out on each and every time I might disagree with the president. I don't believe that's my role. I certainly didn't do it under President Obama. I'm not gonna do it under President Trump. I'm gonna stay very focused on the work that I think my constituents want me to be focused on. Parker, what about you from an operative standpoint, or how do you um, think about the divide maybe in the party in terms of Trump? I mean, first, I'm not sure that there's a greater divide in our party than there is in the other party. Um, so maybe dispute that a little bit. But overall, you know, we tell our candidates to run the races, to run their own race, um, and talk about the issues that matter to the people they want to represent. And Sometimes that is the issue that is on the national news at the moment. And sometimes that's a more local issue. Sometimes that's about flooding in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or you know, the um, roads to Staten Island, or the um, you know, public transportation system in the suburbs of Charlotte. And those are the things that the constituents care about. And if you, I agree with, with Representative Brooks. You don't need to respond to every single thing that um, is said by the presidential candidate, regardless of your party. Um, I think, you know, Republicans agree on a, on a lot of things. Democrats agree together on a lot of things. And there are areas where there's divergence. And um, I don't I don't think that this is a particularly um, unusual circumstance from that standpoint. OK. Um, let's see, we have time for one more question from Jessica. In your opinion, what do you think is the biggest misconception Republican women face? Hmm. Um, I think um, the biggest misconception is probably um, that we um, that we might all agree on everything together. 
And I might have a disagreement with um, a Virginia Fox or a Kathy McMorris Rogers or Ann Wagner or Jackie. We don't always vote always the same way. We might not always agree on something. That happens though on the Democrat side as well within their party as well. So I think that um, people, you know, believe that um, Republican women often don't care about what are viewed as women's issues as much as the Democrat women, because that has been a theme that the Democrats have used and nothing could be further from the truth. And that is because Republican women really believe that all issues are women's issues. Um, abortion is not just a woman's issue. It's a woman and a man's issue. Issues around the second amendment are not, you know, um, just a man's issue. It's a woman's issue. Issues around the economy, around healthcare. I think what might be different is we believe these are all women's issues. Women are engaged in all issues. And, um, the issue, the issues that I think the Democrats try to own, so to speak, um, and say that the Republicans don't care about as much, I think we set that aside, particularly when it comes to the Women's Caucus that I have co-chaired. We work on issues with Democrats where we know we can find common ground, where we know that women pay particular attention to, whether it was around um, the Me Too movement, whether it was around issues around childcare, whether it's around how women are treated around the globe. We come together on things we can come together on, but all issues are women's issues. Democrats don't own women's issues. Parker, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, the one I might um, add, which is, a, is maybe more particular, I, I, I think Republican voters often think that Republican women aren't as conservative. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a misnomer. It's kind of in a different category than Congresswoman Brooks is. But I think, you know, I think our, our Republican women, members and candidates represent the entire spectrum of the Republican Party and um, have, as, as she pointed out, as diverse beliefs as the male candidate. And so I think that's just a personal frustration sometimes I have. Um, especially when we get women in primaries that they're just perceived to be less conservative. But um, having worked on the board for some time and um, spent, spent time with the Republican women members, I can confidently say that they are um, just, as, just as conservative and have just as much diversity in their views as well. Is that something that you all specifically saw in the first election last year in North Carolina with Jim Perry? Um, you know, we didn't, we, I, I feel like maybe Congresswoman Brooks, you want to talk about Dr. Joan Perry, because that was um, a case where the NRCC wasn't involved in that primary. Yes. And, and I, I did support Joan Perry and all the women in our conference did support Joan Perry. But I think what we learned um, in that race as well, it was her first time to run for office. And while she has amazing credentials and background, and I hope she considers running again um, or running for some office again, and I think she'd be an amazing uh, um, office holder, um, you know, it because it was her first time to run, she was up against a very seasoned elected official who really knew how to run a campaign. And so I think, you know, those women who lose that first campaign, um, I think, uh, we'll see them back and we need to continue to encourage them to come back. And I think she's, she could have an incredibly bright future in the party. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the teams you assemble, how you run a campaign actually matters as much as your credentials. Uh, before we let you guys go, I want to um, let everybody know what we have coming up um, in a couple of uh, weeks. Um, we have uh, next week, um, Capricia Marshall, uh, who's going to be here uh, to discuss her new book, uh, Protocol. She was a chief of uh, protocol under President Obama, uh, and she has a new book about the power uh, of diplomacy. So she'll be here to talk about that. And then the next week, we have um, Joni Ernst here um, to talk about her new book. 
um, Daughter of the Heartland, and that'll be on June 17th, uh, same station, same time. So please be sure to uh, follow us and um, keep up uh, to the events that we have um, coming up. And we want to thank Congresswoman Brooks and Parker. Um, both of you uh, were so kind to share your analysis and your thoughts and give us a really, I think, helpful debrief on where we are um, with 152 days to go. And maybe we'll try to get you guys back um, in October, November to give us a little bit of the, the landscape right before the election. But I thank you so much for all the information here with us and for taking our questions and being here tonight. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks for including me and everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Great. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, have a great week. Thank you.